Good day, Observation Deck viewers. In this episode, no matter where you live, who is making a claim or what the claim is, I thought I would cover some documents and leave you to download and adapt and edit as you see fit. What these documents are designed to do is take away the power and jurisdiction of any administrative courts. They are designed to clean up not only the presumed jurisdiction of these types of courts, but to establish your standing without having to claim it in their courts, as you will plainly see. So I'm not going to waste much time on any further discussion about that. I'll see you on the other side. Hi and welcome to the latest episode of the Observation Deck. First, I want to update you on some things. I am lining up some great guests for the coming weeks and I hope you will bear with me while myself and those guests balance our timetables in order to bring you more exclusive content. I have also placed in the description below a link where you can locate and get yourself trained as a paralegal and it's not as difficult as it sounds and I hope to have Dr. Graves on the show very soon who authored the course and I must say I have gleaned a lot from it already and I'm only about a third of the way through but having Dr. Graves on will help explain sorry Dr. Graves my apologies, will explain it in much more detail and perhaps even get some great inside information from this veteran attorney. And if you want to take a peek behind the observation deck, I actually did an interview with David from SPLS Pro on his channel IndieGlow this week. And I think it was a first for me because I was being interviewed by someone else rather than me being in the driver's seat. So if you're interested in the man behind the voice and maybe get some great life tips, I'll leave a link in the description below to David's interview of yours truly on his YouTube channel IndieGlow. OK, so let's get to these documents. The first document was actually created way back in 2006 and obviously, as you would expect on the Internet, got lost in the sea of information. But it's been resurrected and I have added my own details to it for this particular show. For those not living in the United Kingdom, it should be easy for you to adapt it to your local laws, I'm sure, since it questions the validity of the court itself in a way that compels those who think they can sit in judgment to seriously think again. So rather than fight the claim that's got you there in the first place, it may help first to establish the validity of the court and their actual jurisdiction, which, will, which you will see is not really a court at all. So let us take a look at the first document, which you will be able to download on the link in the description below, as well as the other uh, documents that I'm going to mention. But obviously, you will need to edit it to suit your own circumstances. Oh, and the second document I'll be showing you, and there'll be a couple of them, actually, a few of them. Uh, so second document I show you has both a UK version and a USA version. So be sure to download the correct one. And the second one is, in fact, in the form of a simple affidavit and takes away the need for you to establish the roles played out within the administrative and higher court systems by stating in a lawful document prior to you stepping into the court. So you're going to file it what roles each player actually has when stated for the record. So let's have a look at the first document. So I'm just going to take you through uh, this document that uh, I've added to and has its originality, I think, as I said, in 2006. But let's have a look at all administrative courts are unlawful. And here's why. So I've written, obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, the next time you get any BS from the local council, police or any other revenue collecting disguised as a charge or a fine, I suggest you read the following form. These facts make up some pertinent questions to send prior to agreeing any invitation to appear. 
I'm not going to do it all for you. I have actually put a couple of questions in there. But once you read this, my suggestion is create an affidavit when you get um, some kind of fine or whatever and send it to whoever's making the claim. And that this will also cover council tax, etc. But um, once you've read through this, then you can uh, come up with a few of your own questions that you can just slap into an affidavit. And remember, if it's unrebutted, well... Let's move on. Housbury Laws of England are regarded as the overall authority on England's law under the statutes. Now, I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to bore you with all of the details of the Acts and Statutes. All right. But um, the Constitutional Treaty and Financial Acts. So it goes on to say that the British Constitution is said to be unwritten. But this only means that, unlike most countries, the United Kingdom does not possess a single comprehensive constitution and much of its constitutional principle is embodied in common law. There are nevertheless a number of historic statutes regarding as embodying and setting forth the state's constitutional principles. So, firstly, any modern act which amends or adds to these may also be regarded as a const constitutional act. So, all right. The main significance of classing an act as constitutional acts lies in the nature of the interpretive criteria which then apply to it. In particular, the rights the act confers having the quality of constitutional rights will be regarded by the courts as fundamental and not to be displaced except by clear words. Remember that, not to be displaced. So once it's there, it's there. Now, obviously, uh, there's a, a load of other quotes put in here. See Magna Carta, Bill of Rights, Act of Settlement, Septennial Act. And you can also see the Parliament Acts, etc., etc. So moving on, the Constitution derives from the Magna Carta, also the Bill of Rights and all the other acts in there. As I say, I'm not going to bore you with the details because I don't want to make it any longer than I have to. And I know you're busy people. But as Lord Halsbury stated, it is a constitutional principle that the assent of the Queen and Parliament is a prerequisite to the establishment of a court which can operate a system of administrative law in Her Majesty's courts in England. So it's either got to be one or both of these. It's got to be assent of the Queen and Parliament. Obviously, it goes through Parliament first, but it's a prerequisite. So just remember that it has to be done there first. This was confirmed by Lord Denning during the debates on the European Communities Amendment Bill, etc. There is in our judicial system, deriving from the crown as the source and fountain of justice. No court can be set up in England. No court can exist in England except by the authority of the Queen and Parliament. And that has been so ever since the Bill of Rights. In other words, when you get that little reply from the local authority saying, well, we've been given license by the clerk of the court to issue summonses. It's absolute bullcrap, OK, because the crown as the source and fountain of justice. No court can be set up in England. No court can exist in England except by the authority of the Queen and Parliament. And that would include no jumped up little clerk of the court that the councils rely on to get you in on a summons. So it says, Performing administrative acts on behalf of the executive is incompatible with the terms of the oath which a judge takes when they are created under Section 2 of the Promissory, uh, Promissory Oaths Act 1868, which every judge must take. So what that basically means is that any administrative acts on behalf of the executive, in this case the executive is either the local government or the government itself, but in this case, obviously, if it's like, for instance, council tax or whatever, or on the spot fine, it is whoever the executive is. But it's incompatible with the terms of the oath which a judge takes when they are created under Section 2. So I hope I've made that clear. A breach of that oath is perjury. Furthermore, no authority, local or otherwise, especially when it is nothing more than a for-profit Duns registered corporation, has neither the right nor the judicial capacity to send out a summons, let alone attempt to enforce it. it it's all fraud. Courts themselves, well, administrative courts, uh, such as the ones that we're talking about, not necessarily magistrates' courts, because if the case file is done correctly and the judge actually stamps it and all the rest of it, I mean, you've seen, you know, bailiffs, warrants and all this kind of stuff without 
actually any three-dimensional court stamp on it or signature or whatever it's all fraud it's literally all corporate fraud done by profit for uh, sort of organizations so if the argument is that common law has no basis in administrative law proceedings and therefore is irrelevant it should be noticed that administrative law has not been sanctioned by parliament so we're going back to this letter that people get in response to freedom of information acts which i've seen myself where the local council said well we've been licensed by the clerk of the court well the clerk of the court has no authority because it hasn't been sanctioned by Parliament. So when they say, well, that guy over there licensed me to do it, and we'll come on to licensing in a little while, it's, it's utter BS. And just in case you're under any illusion, courts, any courts without a jury uh, present is simply an administrative court. Now, it doesn't make all administrative courts illegal, as it were, but in the case of, I would say, 90% of the stuff that you and I have to protect ourselves against when it comes to these claims is certainly not gone through due process and uh, pre-action protocols all administrative courts are unlawful actions which overthrow and subvert the laws and constitution of the kingdom and which would lead to the destruction of the constitution are unlawful and as in the case of rv thistlewood 1820 established that to destroy the constitution of the country is an act of treason Halesbury's Administrative Law 2010, which would probably be a better one to cite if you were, say, I don't know, create an affidavit and citing certain questions. But Halesbury's Administrative Law of 2011, fourth edition, confirms that administrative law is nothing more than an arrangement between the executive, local authority, and the judiciary. It's an arrangement, I underline that, which doesn't make it law, lawful, or legal. You can't just throw out the book on the constitution um, and ignore the fact that parliament hasn't actually given you permission to that and just have an arrangements locally between yourself and the local magistrates court and that the law is absolutely clear on this subject there is no authority for the administrative courts in this country and no act could be passed to legitimize them remember these are all run by corporations Lord Diplock stated, it's recorded in Housebury's Law, all administrative courts are illegal and can never be legislated into existence. Performing administrative acts on behalf of the executive is incompatible with the terms of the oath, which judges take, as I've already mentioned. So you can quote Housebury Law and Law, Lord uh, Dipcock. So... And a breach of oath is perjury. So you can see the Perjuries Act 1911, Section 5, uh, which I've stuck in there for you. To add, administrative law, so-called, forms no part of the laws and usages of the realm, which judges swear to the sovereign to uphold via promissory oath that binds them to a specific course of conduct. Otherwise, they cannot be said to perform their judicial duties impartially. Now, the problem that uh, a lot of these things, and I'll, I'll focus on the council tax side of things for a second because I haven't really covered that in any other episode. But so, for instance, the council tax, you'll notice that the judges kind of step aside on this because there actually is no judge that has put their signature or stamp on that. This is always the clerk of the court because it's the administrative court and they know they are way out on a limb. And let's be honest with you, any judge that's taken an actual oath to the sovereign to uphold the law is not going to place themselves in a position of perjury uh, treason or uh, any kind of public liability in order to help a profit-making corporation collect money off you that they're not supposed to in a way that they're doing it and again it was confirmed by lord denning during the debate of the european communities uh, amendment bill hl and as i said uh, so that that really repeats what was said there but uh, the case law of r donovan in delivering the judgment of the court of criminal appeal this is 1934 said if an act is unlawful in the sense of being itself a criminal act it is plain that it cannot be rendered lawful because the person whose detriment it is done consents to it no person can license another to commit a crime so let me just break that down for you so if an act is unlawful in the sense of itself in being a criminal act, i.e. Uh, local councils printing out their own summonses, that in itself 
is a criminal act because it hasn't been sanctioned by Parliament and there really is no uh, judicial authority that has actually allowed them to do this. So it is plain that it cannot be rendered lawful because the person whose detriment it is done consents to it. In other words, you may have consented to appearing on a summons for a council tax, uh, unpayment of council tax, for instance, but you're actually consenting to it under duress because you're being threatened at the same time if you do not appear in our for profit making administrative court, etc., etc., this will be done to you. So, a person whose detriment is done consent to it, so it can't be rendered lawful, all right, because you can't, um, no person can license clerk of the court another local authority to commit a crime and the crime here is clearly that these summonses have not been sanctioned by parliament or the queen so it's just a plc saying i'm going to give you a fine yeah right in other words no authority such as court clerk can license a local authority to break the law by issuing summonses without a case file and due process and thus creates misrepresentation malfeasance and breaches the principles of public office otherwise known as the nolan principles here in the united kingdom one only has to ask under what parliamentary authority do you have as a corporation to issue a summons the answer to that, folks, if you didn't already know, is none. But you might also want to ask, where is the full and complete case file? Reminding them of CPR Part 31, Civil Procedure Rules Part 31. And I've stuck a link in there for you uh, so you can figure that one out for yourself. Because and, and it's not just for local authorities at CPR Part 31. I think all of you should know it, especially, you know, obviously, if you're living in the United Kingdom. For the simple reason is when you get... Um, somebody making a claim against you and you ask for validation of that claim well you can start reading CPR part 31 because they have to supply you the documents that validate their claims it's I mean in in court parlance it's called discovery and they have to give you the documents if they withhold those documents then they're obviously concealing it or they don't have a valid claim so get to know cpr part 31 at least and as i said on previous episodes you don't need to know the law because there are so many of them it's absolutely ridiculous nobody knows all laws pertaining to all crimes and and, and whatever it is you just need to know what you need to know in your particular case and I suspect that most of us who have had a claim against us if you're asking for documents then uh, you might want to quote CPR part 31 it goes on to say that Justice Swift is telling us that driving without a government document such as licenses MOTs etc cannot be of in itself criminal as the government licenses these acts and therefore they cannot be criminal this is still a leading case which can be seen from this document which can be found in the House of Lords website all right. So um, as far as this ability for different bodies to license other people to do stuff. Um, yeah. But in the case of uh, driver's licenses, MOTs, don't start driving around without a license and MOT unless you want to get stopped every five minutes. If you haven't done your due diligence in which order, which gave you the status to be able to do that in the first place, then it's not as straightforward as many people think. So you don't just knock out an affidavit, but that's a, an episode for a different day in regards driving your private uh, transportation and removing your property from DVLA, which I might cover with somebody later on. Anyway, so. That covers so far the administrative courts. There's enough there and their treasonous application of the legal shenanigans. But whatever they're pulling, it's unlawful nonetheless. Now, I thought I'd add to this document while I was at it because I got a bit carried away as usual. But regarding the right of passage, because I'm kind of peeved about lockdowns and all the rest of it 
But ex parte Lewis, 1888, said in regard to the public right of passage, I know I'm going off track here, but I thought I'd throw this one in as part of the document. The only dedication in the legal sense that we are aware of is that a public right of passage of which the legal description is right for all Her Majesty's subjects at all seasons of the year freely and at their will to pass and repass without let or hindrance. By definition, a financial penalty, fixed notices, procured through a pecuniary advantage, howsoever called, is diametrically opposed to without let or hindrance. Plus the fact that, as many of you know, that under the uh, UK Bill of Rights, unless a judge has actually given you a fine, these little wooden tops walking along all over the place, environmental officers, police revenue collectors in those uniforms and all the rest of it, have actually no right to start dishing out on-the-spot fines. Nobody can act as um, judge, jury and executioner all in one. And you don't have to satisfy the personal view of the idiot standing there with, I'm going to issue you with a fixed penalty fine. That, yeah, you know who I'm talking about. Because this is operating outside of statutes. As a human being cannot be levied by the state or company, because they're all PLCs, they're all private prof profit companies, only juristic persons, legal entities, in this case, a judge, can be so levied against. In other words, establish your living status, evidence through affidavit, and get on with your life. Okay. You can also add the Act of the Union 1707, which states our God-given right to free movement. Just check the inside cover if you've got a, a pass UK passport. Just check the inside cover page of your passport for confirmation, and then ask the other person about lockdown because it talks about free package. Uh, passage and the Act of the Union 1707 I've added here for you just so you can remind people that you have full freedom and intercourse of trade and navigation to and from any port or place within the said United Kingdom and the dominions and plantations thereunto belonging. It goes on to say that all laws and statutes in either kingdom, so far as they are contrary or inconsistent with the terms of these articles, 1707, so that would be locked down, because they're inconsistent with 1707, all of them shall from and after the union cease and become void and shall be so declared to be by the respective parliaments of said kingdom. Void, become void. Get to know this stuff, guys. It's not a lot to remember. All right, so that basically covers administrative courts and the lockdown. I thought I'd throw the lockdowns in there. And uh, as I said earlier, I will put this particular document that's been clanked together um, in the description below, and you can download that and play with it as you will. And as I said earlier, you might want to ask a couple of questions in there. And um, I mean, as I say, I, I mentioned a couple of questions in there that you could use when you get one of those little letters from a local authority and uh, it, well if it remains unrebutted you know as well as I do it becomes truth in law so let me move on to the following document that will suffice for both the United well it will suffice for every commonwealth country every common law country the United States Canada doesn't matter where you live you can deal with the next document so let's have a look at that so let me preface this second document with a couple of explana explanatory phrases and words. And that is that we all know that when you go into any given court, there's a, there's a trust. Okay, a trust has already been set up prior to you walking in that court. And we all know that you or me um, are the beneficiary and the prosecutor might be the executor or the trustee and the uh, judge is the trustee and they've already signed their checkbooks and all the rest of it so everything is a trust but obviously the bait and switch that the legal system pull on you is they get you to become the trustee and they end up being the beneficiary and they make all sorts of fraudulent claims and they won't take on the position of trustee so if you can stand there and say i'm a living man and you're a trustee the chances are let's be honest folks you're going to get thrown out of court they're going to try and try you for contempt of court which is very difficult because you're not a member of the bar anyway but there you go but the point being is that they pull all of this crap on us in order to make us the surety for the revenue that they expect to collect off of that court case now there are certain terms and conditions within trust law that states that you 
can be the executor and you you appoint the trustees and and one of the little ditties that you may not under uh, may not be aware of is that in certain circumstances you don't actually have to tell the trustee that they're a trustee so you can keep that one in mind when you're creating your documents but let's just take a look rather than stand up in court we know that an affidavit is far more powerful so this particular document says what is a letter of appointment of executor now this was sent to me by a, a colleague of mine john um it came as a complete pdf file but uh, i just pulled out the relevant parts which is just this and and, and the actual uh, appointment letter itself which again i will leave in the links in the description below but a letter of appointment of executor assists one in proving they have been put in charge of someone else's estate after the person has passed away now let's just break that down for you for a second you're in charge of someone's estate you've all heard it on you know the some of the movies that you see where all arguing over the will and uh, oh my god the executor of the state is uh, been given permission to dish out whatever the uh, the deceased wishes were etc that's usually when they start questioning competency and then change the will anyway but that's another story but the executor assists one in proving they have been put in charge of someone's estate after the person has passed away well think of it this way the person that's passed away is the dead entity fiction okay they've already i mean they were never living in the first place and you are now going to be the appointment of the executor you're going to create the appointment of the executor of that dead person so as the executor you possess the duty to manage the estate and carry out the directions of the will but a court may request official documentation though it's not a requirement and sometimes oftentimes when a judge and or prosecutor receive a notarized letter of appointment of executor well they begin to get very nervous because once you give them notice of your relationship to the estate or with the estate they are no longer in the position to fraudulently presume that you are simply a trustee that they can team up on and find at fault are you getting this people you are going to before you even walk into court create an affidavit explaining the positions and you're definitely not going to take the position of trustee so as long as your letter of appointment of office of executor is notarized and remotely close to the sample document that i'm going to show you in a second it will be more than acceptable form uh, of the document so and and to give it even more gravitas you can even have a friend or family member provide you with an eyewitness affidavit attesting to the fact that you are the executor or beneficiary preferably both and that they witnessed you appoint the clerk prosecutor and judge or magistrate to the offices of trustee and then you can collapse the Sestakev Trust. Now, when we say collapse the Sestakev Trust, we mean for that case. You, obviously, you're never going to collapse the whole trust. There's a whole lot more to be doing if you're going to do the, uh, the big kahuna, as it were. But in this case, you're going to collapse the Sestakev Trust that they want to dip into when they dish out a fine and then double dip by getting you to pay your hard-earned, fiat, useless currency money, should I say sorry so let's have a look at how simple it is this is the american version but i've uh, anglified a separate document which again i will put in the description below so sample affidavit so obviously for my american viewers in the state of in the county of affidavit of truth affidavit of notice of letter of appointment of execution uh, executor affidavit of notice to correct the records the court records so i john of the family doe make oath and depose the following facts okay now you could either use the word depose or affirm it doesn't matter because the affian and deposee is it's exactly the same thing anyway uh, i john of the family named doe am hereby providing you with notice that i am alive and not lost at sea and am the appointed occupant of the office of the executor and the office of the beneficiary of the estate entitled in your all caps name there is no written administrative authority to administer the all caps name doo -doo -doo, estate listed herein as the executor and beneficiary of the john doe estate associated with case number obviously slap that in there i challenge 
all claims of authority, administrative authority, and hereby appoint judge, magistrate. Now, if you can get their name, you can. Uh, if not, from, from an English point of view, or if you haven't got that information yet, which you should have, otherwise you wouldn't be writing this out in the first place, um, then if you haven't got the judge, magistrate name, you say basically who is ever sitting. There's a word for it. Um, uh, bear with me for a second. Ah, yeah, it's, it, it's basically called officer incumbent. All right, so it's appointment judge in case number such and such, incumbent judge or magistrate. So incumbent simply me means, look, the position it always stays, but the person holding that position may come and go. It's a bit like the Chancellor of the Exchequer. The title, the position, the office always stays, and then different chancellors are appointed. So if you can't find the judge or magistrate's name, then you basically use the phrase officer incumbent. To the office of trustee, um, prosecutor, whatever their name is, or in, again, officer incumbent, if you don't know their name, to the office of trustee and the clerk to the office of trustee. So you have made basically the judge, magistrate, prosecutor and the clerk trustees. How cool is that? I collapse the trust and hereby declare there is no value in it, which there isn't for you. You're the beneficiary, of course. Cease and desist all fraudulent misrepresentations and other false presumptions. Please update all records to reflect the unrebutted facts provided herein as soon as possible in order to show good faith in this matter and an ethical desire to verify information and make proper corrections upon presentment of my eyewitness affidavit and notice of the information required to be updated. A copy of this notice has been filed with a respected court and serviced to the three trustees. Aforementioned, those guys. A copy of this affidavit has all been saved for my personal records. As beneficiary, all trustees are hereby given notice that they must keep accurate records and do not have the executor or beneficiary's consent to access the trust or to permit records to remain in error. Well, I was supposed to say in error. Records must be corrected within three business days of receiving this notice and a copy of this affidavit is to be placed on record as sworn statement in regards to this matter. Now, let me just sort of... Um, Hang on, let me just finish this. I hereby certify a true and correct copy of the foregoing was sent on the date of using... Now, obviously, you, you, you would list where it was done, but in the UK, then you would use special delivery because that would still be a certificate of service. You, you make sure you put the special delivery number on there and then you can add served on because if you've used special delivery, then the document is classed as served. Now, let me just jump back here. Records must be corrected in three business days receiving this notice and a copy of this affidavit is to place on record as a sworn statement regards this matter. Now, as a point of court order, you need to understand that if you file something in a court, it doesn't matter what the documents are. In this case, obviously, we'll use it, uh, the affidavit as an example. But if you file an affidavit in court, then what you've got to do to actually get it on record is mention that affidavit. Sorry, I was distracted by someone with a chainsaw at the bottom of my garden. Hopefully they've gone now after a chat. Now, the records must be corrected in three business days of receiving the notice and a copy of this affidavit is placed on record. Now, when we place a file on record, it is only on record. OK, it is not recorded in the court hearing. And that's where people make the mistake that they think that because they've placed something on file, it's done and dusted. It isn't. You have to mention it on court and bring it into evidence verbally. And then you can hand that affidavit out. I mean, they'll try and stop you, obviously. But if it's, and you insist on a court of record, so you make damn sure that you just drop a little bombshell in there saying, oh, did you receive my affidavit? Oh, no, 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 no. No, my affidavit I'd like to put on uh, I'd like to move the court to put it on record move the court is the phrase by the way uh, move the court to put it on record and now what you filed because they'll say well no if not you haven't filed it no it's on file uh, your honor so uh, I'd like to put it on the record as opposed to on file all right there's a difference between filing and on and recorded within that case so don't forget that bit so verbally get that affidavit on onto the record and they will uh, not be too happy about that and you'll be smiling so continue hereby certify and I've already mentioned that but anyway and then you've got 
judge magistrate address i mean you could put the care of obviously whatever the courthouse is and the same with that if you can find the state attorney uh prosecutor's address then fine um or an email address clerk of the court address uh, applicable and then obviously you can sign it certificate of service now i hereby certify under the penalty of perjury all information provided and is true and accurate to the best of my knowledge this is for my american friends ucc all rights reserved without prejudice and you can fill that in notary acknowledgement notary name signature my commission expires and you might want to even chuck as we mentioned earlier uh, a, a witness or two or a separate affidavit that you can get notarized and you're good to go now obviously in the uk let me explain what a certificate of service is because i put certificate of service on all my documents at the bottom of it and a certificate of service basically means it's been served and as i mentioned earlier if you're using special delivery then simply in fact oh, let me show you one of the documents that i've sent out to uh, i think it was the attorney general or something here in the uk and what a certificate of service for my uk viewers actually looks like so here's one i sent to pretty uh sushil patel a secretary of state and you can see here that below my autograph i always slap in there a certificate of service and i robert certify this is certified copy of the foregoing was provided by uk special delivery and then you're obviously you've got your delivery number to, and then i've put the address on this 27th day of february 2021 so i'm still busy doing it and then i put this little bit down here just to make sure that they know that certificate of service is allowed and it, we call it uh, served by using these laws as per section 196 section 4 of the law of property act 1925 lpa provides that any notice shall be sufficiently served if it is served by registered post or recorded delivery by virtue of section 1 of the recorded delivery service act 1962 furthermore under section 127 subsection 4 of the postal services act 2000 and psa 2000 section 8 part 3 paragraphs 2 and 3 so that basically absolutely gives you a slam dunk on you have been served and that's what it looks like i haven't actually got that on the documents but i'm sure you can pause the screen and you can do it for yourselves there you have it so what i want to show you now just to round off is what i think was the original of what i've shown you so far in terms of the administrative courts and um, again i'll leave a copy because it was in the public domain it's not mine uh, I'll leave a copy in the links below and you can download that one as well. And then between all of this, you might have a very uh, good overstanding of the sorts of things that you need to do when someone is making a claim against you and you're getting very, very close to getting a court summons or in fact, you've had a court summons. So let's just take a quick look at the original. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details because I've already covered them in the first part of this on the original document. But this particular original one was dated, uh, it was around 2006, I think it was. But the, the most important parts, and again, I, I will put this in there, even though there is sort of a repetition of what I've shown you already. It gives you an idea of how this particular individual, who hasn't signed this, by the way, I haven't even redacted any of it because there's nothing personal in it but um it's it, he just writes i presume it's a he sorry ladies it could be a she uh, it is my understanding from reading housebury law of england that no magistrates or county courts shouldn't exist which is absolutely correct of course they should but but when someone is summoned it is an administrative meeting without any lawful existence as i've already stated and if it has transpired, it is a breach of the Fraud Act 2006, and it talks about the sections 3, 4, and 5, uh, 2, 3, and 4 below, which you can read here. As the judge, magistrate, clerk, or prosecutor to step outside their lawful remit and become personally liable. Now, this is a particularly, now for me, this was a particularly important sentence here, because what you're going to do, or what um, some people have done, I'm not suggesting that you do any of this really because I can't give you legal advice and I don't intend to. You need to seek the advice of a professional, blah, blah, blah. Now, what I would do personally is that when the, when the uh, local authority of Turban says we've been licensed by the clerk of the court, then I would go straight away and find out who the hell the clerk of the court is and then whack a, an affidavit for them to rebut 
upon them, asking them, show me the parliamentary-backed, royal-assented legislation, act, law, whatever you want to call it, Mr. Clerk of the Court, that gives you the right to allow the local or for-profit business authority, gives you the personal right, the personal private right in your capacity to allow somebody else outside the judicial system to start knocking out summonses all over the place um you know corporates corporations you might call them local authority but you've got their duns number the vat number and uh, or whatever it might be but i would definitely whack an affidavit on the person who made the courts uh, made the local council summons possible in the first place because who gave them permission to issue a license and we've already discussed licenses anyway so i would take that way but it is my understanding that demanding monies by false representation is a breach of the fraud act section two it's my understanding that demanding monies without um menaces is a disclosure of breach of the fraud act is my understanding that demanding monies without providing evidence of authority of jurisdiction is breach of the fraud act so there's three now um they're making statements here, which is absolutely correct. Obviously, you would change the phrasing of these statements if you were to include these in your own affidavit by turning these into questions concerning the validity and jurisdiction of the summons that you have received. And again, they're, they're quoting House Bill's Law on Administrative Law, Section 2. 20 to uh, 11 the law is absolutely clear on this subject there is no authority to administer courts in this country and no act can be passed to legitimize slim no authority for administrative courts sorry in this country and no act that can be passed to legitimize them so there you have it folks um it does go on on to civil war uh, civil law uh, civil war freudian slip uh, roman law prevailed alfred the great and all the rest of it so you want a bit of a history on that then then you know it's it's for an interesting read it's only two pages long but i will leave that with you now i will shift to my summation and i hope you found this information of help well i hope that little foray into those documents were helpful for you now as far as i'm concerned i've always worked on the rule that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line and in the cases of whatever the claims are against you it's not about questioning the claims themselves although one needs to do so but a question of legality lawfulness and jurisdiction the moment you introduce an affidavit into the mix the fictional entity dies and it reveals in very few cases, you know, anyone willing to stand and make a claim against you, the living man or woman, because you have just put an affidavit in and on the record. In order for you, for your evidence to be rebutted, you have the right to face your accuser in a court. And as we know, fictions cannot enter a rebuttal. And the PLCs disguised as something else will not put forward a lamb to the slaughter, which is why we name the one who is to be sacrificed on the altar of our justice. And of course, they fail to appear, in which then it's case dismissed. But in the case of a representative for a, any corporate fiction, well, they're easily dismantled, not by arguing the case, but insisting they speak under oath and for the record. And if, like many of us, are now waking up to the fact that you have slipped your affidavit into the court of record and not just filed it, they are now in an impossible position since they have no standing nor first-hand knowledge and you can object every time this fictional entity representative attempts to speak by simply citing hearsay, Your Honour, and that you move the court to dismiss the case with prejudice prejudice, which basically means they can't come back at you at a later date. I, like many of you, would rather secure my position long before any compulsion to appear and the ability to cite case laws, create affidavits and even use the civil procedure rules against them, especially in uh, Document Disclosure Part 31 on them. It means you will win more often than not, but you must do your own due diligence. And, as usual, my books, as you can see on the screen there, boom, 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 help you and myself to support the work I do and get you into a paralegal 
mindset, as I would say. I um, have already made, I've already had some great emails uh, about diffusing the debt bomb saying that success has already been had in dealing with agencies in, in using diffusing the debt bomb, my latest book. So I know that in principle it works. Um, and just to finish off, I've got some great interviews coming up and I hope you stick around for those in the coming weeks and have learned a little more today, which will help you stand your ground and you're going to be shown how to become your own paralegal, complete with certification from a 26 year veteran attorney. So until next time, question everything, believe nothing and stay curious and I'll see you on deck very soon. <laughs>